I appreciate you guys coming on a Sunday night to come hang out and talk about recruiting. Uh, my name is Tim Ryerson. Uh, I know Coach Vlada a little bit. Uh, we go back a little bit, so he set this up. I guess he's not here today, but um, he's excited for me to talk with you guys, and I'm excited to talk with you. If you haven't checked out our company, it's Student Athlete World. That's going to be the last time I'm going to mention it today, because what I want today to be about is uh, I want it to be very educational for you. So I want you to leave here, regardless if you end up working with us or not, I want you to leave here thinking, man, I'm glad I came, because I learned a lot about recruiting, and I really feel better off looking at the college recruiting process that I came tonight. The other thing I hope I do tonight is entertain you a little bit. Uh, it's Sunday, you gotta go to work, you gotta go to school tomorrow, so I don't want you to be, feel like you're sleeping through a meeting, I want this to be fun. I might crack a joke or two, so I want you to laugh at my jokes. Uh, see you're starting already. Uh, so uh, entertaining and educational is what it's all about. I'm gonna go through a lot about the recruiting process and uh, at the very end, I want to save a lot of time for the questions and answers. So as I'm talking at the beginning, start thinking about those questions that you really want to talk about. Because I want this to be specific to you guys and beneficial for you. Uh, like I said, my name is Tim, my colleague here is Bob Jackson. Uh, he lives down in Southern Ponds. He works with athletes in North Carolina. Uh, I own Student Athlete World, so I work with athletes nationwide. Um, and my lovely wife's over there on camera. So uh, that's, that's the crew here today. Uh, before I get going, let, let me introduce myself a little bit for you so you know who it is that's talking with you. Um, I coach college basketball and college cross country um, for eight years. So one of the things that I think is really important in the recruiting process is um, recruiting is one of those industries that everybody thinks they know everything about it, right? Anybody that goes on ESPN.com or, or logs on the internet thinks they know what recruit, how it works, right? And to me, that's really frustrating because we hear daily a lot of myths and a lot of misconceptions and a lot of nonsense that gets spewed out there. Because everyone loves talking about recruiting, right? Uh, what I think is really important is to listen to the right people. And I don't think I'm the smartest guy in the world, and I don't think that I know everything about recruiting, but I've been there and I've done it. I've recruited kids just like you guys. I chose to not recruit kids just like you guys and I've been on the other side of it. So I think I can provide some really valuable uh, education for you about this process. So I think that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, I coached in Texas, Wisconsin, Nebraska, and North Carolina. When I was in North Carolina, I coached at uh, Methodist University and St. Andrews College. Um, I did, so you, so you know I'm a lacrosse guy. I had to dig this up in the archives. I did actually play lacrosse in college. <laughs> Not very well, but when I was in college, my senior year, I saw some guys uh, out in the yard with some funny looking sticks throwing the ball, and I had never even heard of what the sport was. This is a long time ago. Um, some of you told me I was young, so I appreciate that, but it was a long time ago, and um, it's Wisconsin, where you know there was no lacrosse in Wisconsin in, in 2000, 1999. So um, I went down there and said, let me try that, and I started playing with it, and I ended up actually playing on the team and uh, my second year, I actually was the leading scorer on the team. I couldn't do anything other than run around the crease, catch it, shoot it. I could not even cradle the stick, but I was really good at that one thing. So, uh, so anyway, I wanted to give you some of my lacrosse background. But what I'm going to talk about today has more to do with recruiting uh, in general. So uh, I could sit here and say everything. You have to do this, you have to do this, and you have to do it my way, and you have to do it this way to get recruited. But I don't want to do that. Instead, what I want to talk about today is I want to give you five things that you should not do in the recruiting process. And these are from our experience, from my coaching experience, and from, we've been doing student athlete world now for a little over four years, from our experience of the mistakes that families made during the process and that athletes made that prevented them from getting recruited or from having success in the recruiting process. When I decided to start Student Athlete World, the reason I even got into this business is from being a college coach, I saw so many families like you, and I said, man, these, these families don't even know what they're doing, and they're making these mistakes, and they're not getting the opportunities that they should. So that was really a driving force between me to get into this business. Uh, so that's what we're gonna talk about today. The five most common mistakes, and then what you can do to avoid them. We ready to roll? Awesome, awesome. So um, the number one, Without a doubt, the number one biggest mistake that families make in the recruiting process and athletes make is to target schools above their ability level. 
right? So to target, so maybe in one instance to only target Division I schools, or only target BCS level schools, or only target schools that give out lacrosse scholarships. One of my favorite things to say when I was a, uh, when I was a college coach in the recruiting process was, every team has a leading score. Now think about that for a second. What's the worst team you guys played last season or this last season? Carrie. Okay. Somebody, no one's from Carrie in here, are you? No. Somebody at Carrie High School led them in scoring and was their team MVP and was all conference or something like that. So, and they might be better than some other teams, right? There's probably teams worse than Carrie. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> so, in the recruiting process, uh, a lot of times because you're a good player in high school doesn't automatically mean you're going to be a great player in college. Raise your hand if you've been to and watched an NCAA Division II lacrosse game. Good. Who'd you guys see? Catawba. Catawba? Good. Yeah. Wicked? Mount Austin. Mount Austin? Cool. Anyone else? Raise your hand if you went to and seen an NCAA Division III lacrosse game. Who'd you see? Uh, it was a local team. Cool. Uh, here's the thing I hear a lot is, oh, Division III, that's garbage. That's where all the, the worst players play. That's like intramurals. Well, maybe at some of the very, very worst Division III schools in the country, there's you know 200 and some Division III schools uh, that have lacrosse. So maybe the worst five, yeah, maybe they are bad. But if you really haven't been to watch them play and sat there and looked at their players and looked at yourself and compared you to them, how do you really know, right? Those top end Division III schools in men's lacrosse are really, really good. They're better than most of the Division II schools. You know, not a lot of Division II in lacrosse, of course. There's a lot of Division I, Division III, not a lot of Division II. But um, that's one of the biggest mistakes. It's just assuming that all these coaches, you know, they're, they don't care, the teams are bad. Um, some of them might be bad, but don't have that myth uh, until you know for sure. So get properly evaluated. So what that means is your dad, not a good guy to evaluate you. Not that your dad doesn't know what he's doing, he's probably very smart, probably knows lacrosse, but he's your dad. Your dad's buddy, not a good guy to evaluate you. A non-biased source that is coached at the college level or understands the differences between uh, the competitiveness at those levels. So get properly evaluated is one of the big things that can help you. And then here's another thing. Don't compare yourself to the worst player on the team. So let's say you go to watch Mount Olive, and you see some kid over in the corner trying to pick up a ground ball, and he's kicking it around, and he sucks, right? You think the coach is saying, that kid there, I want to get 10 kids like him. He's trying to recruit 10 kids like his best player, right? So when you go to watch a Division II game, and you see a player that you're better than, that's great. You probably are better than that player. That doesn't mean that Division II school is going to recruit you because they're not looking for more of their worst player. They're looking for more of their best player. Uh, so keep that in mind when you're talking about targeting schools above your ability level. Um, anyone know what a Venn diagram is? You guys learned that in school, right? All the kids probably do, and the parents probably something that you forgot, because it's something you learn in school and you forget. It's overlapping circles, right? So like one circle. That's really how I describe uh, NCAA Division One, Two, and Three. Because a lot of people think it's all the Division I schools, then it's all the Division II, and then it's all the Division III. And you think about the best Division I, like what's, what's the best Division Who won it this past year? Duke. Duke. So Duke's here, and then the worst Division III school is you know Pennsylvania School, the Deaf and Blind, right? Duke, if they play Pennsylvania School in the Deaf and Blind, Duke's gonna win, right? We all know that Duke's better than them. But with the overlapping circles, there may be Division III schools who are better than half Division II, and even some of the bottom of Division I. You know, if they played, and what I mean by better is if they played head to head in a lacrosse game. But then there's all other kinds of definitions of better too. Better academics, better facilities, better coaches, uh, better reputation, better price. You know, whatever your definition of better is, uh, it's about, what we try to tell our clients, it's about finding the right fit. It's not just about being able to tell your buddies or your, your, your colleagues at work 
that my kid went D1, right? So try to take that, try to take that out of there. Okay. So targeting schools above your ability level. Well. Have you heard that before? You know where I've told you that? Good, good. Uh, the second most common mistake that families make is to contact too few schools. So to start with the pool of schools that is, uh, that is too small. What I call this is, is, is the five school model. And a lot of families that we talk to say, well, I'm gonna look at Furman, and I'm gonna look at Elon, and I'm gonna look at Gardner-Webb, and I'm gonna, they pick up five schools, and they say, Tim, can you help me get recruited to those five schools, right? And there's a problem there. There's a problem with that, and I'm gonna explain why. So when I was at Methodist University, so you guys have been at Methodist University, right? I just started the men's lacrosse team, uh, I think two years ago, maybe this last year was her first year playing actual games. Now I coach basketball, so this is gonna be a basketball example, but it's very similar because the number of people on a basketball team is pretty close to lacrosse. There's a few more in lacrosse, um, but it's pretty similar. So my last year there at Methodist was the mother recruiting class of 2008, and we brought in four kids to play uh, on our varsity team for that year. How many kids do you think that we started recruiting in our initial pool of applicants that we then narrowed down to four. And the, whoever's the closest on this is going to win yourself a student <laughs> athlete world backpack. All right? Who wants to guess? 150 kids. It's on the books. 75. Look at how nice this is. 100? 200? 50? 125. 125? Parents, you, you can... 500. 500? 600. 600? <laughs> you go like prices, right? You go like 501. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 300. 300? 300? Anyone else? Going once, going twice? Well, so... Every coach uses something uh, uh, called a database manager, right? So it's an online database manager where they keep track of their recruits and send them emails and write their uh, notes from phone calls and stuff. This is a screenshot of my database, actual database manager, and that number's at the top. Oh, wow. Who was the Arnie. highest bidder? Arnie. Oh, good job. Arnie. Oh, Arnie. Arnie, is that your name? Arnie. 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 Arnie is the closest. <laughs> Although, you know, he's, he's halfway there, but you are the closest, so congratulations. I was going to go higher, but I was being safe. Like, you were being a little bit higher. Nice. 1,103. Tell, think about that for a second. That's a lot higher than 50 or 100, which is, I've been asking that question for four years, and that's where everybody guesses, right in that 100 range. If I have, if I start with 1,100, and I'm really going to only offer four people a spot on the varsity team, it's a crapshoot. Right? I mean, it's not just the I can't honestly pick the best four. Some of it's luck, you know, getting through to be one of those four. Um, some of it's being in the right place at the right time, and it's really tough. So if you're only looking at four schools, and those four schools are looking at a thousand kids, you better be really good, or you better be really lucky. What you want to do is the same thing the coaches are doing, is target a lot of schools target a lot of schools. Now, uh, of these 1,103, how many, well, actually, I'm going to skip that for right now. Uh, I'm going to skip that. I'm going to talk about that in, in the next thing. Um, so, contacting too few schools. Now, there's value in contacting a school or trying to get recruited by a school that you don't even want to go to. Now, I'm going to save that for when we meet in a home visit because it's really, really cool. And I don't want to give everything away to you tonight. But there's value. And a lot of people say that, well, I don't want to go to that school because it doesn't have my major or it doesn't have the academic uh, requirements that I'm looking for. That's fine. Nobody, you don't have to go there. You have to get recruited by them because there's value in that recruiting because that recruiting can lead to other recruiting. It could lead to get you a scholarship offer which then can be leveraged at another school to help you save money 
and to help you get um, be seen as a legitimate scholarship player. So there's value in that, number one. Um, so that is what one of the things that we believe very strongly in is the fact that we want to cast a wide net. So when our clients come to us and say, we really want to go and we really want to play at NC State, can you make it happen? Or we really want to play at Duke, can you make it happen? No, I can't. If you're good enough to play at Duke, you can't hide anywhere. They're going to come find you. If you already have the one school picked out that you're going to go to, go ask the coach who can be on the team. It's as simple as that. They're either going to say yes or they're going to say no. There's really almost nothing that we can do to help you. What we can do and what you can help yourself do is to cast a wide net to see who would be most interested in you. Um, okay, so that's number two. So that's contacting two few schools. Does that make sense? Cool. So the third uh, most common mistake families make is to have a false sense of security. That's another word or another phrase for to have a big ego, right? To have a big ego. Especially with guys uh, compared to girls, we see this a lot more. This is a big problem, a big mistake that guys make, especially in like a manly sport like lacrosse, right? So having a false sense of security means thinking that coaches are going to come find me because I'm good enough or because I got a letter or I got invited to a showcase camp or because I play on an elite travel team, I'm automatically okay in the recruiting process or I'm set. Uh, of these, I'm going to give you another example to kind of uh, illustrate that. Of these 1,103 athletes, how many of them do you think got an email from me that uh, gave them updates on the program, told them how we were doing in our games, and you know, kept them in the loop of what we were doing? How many got that email? Okay. All of them. All of them. All of them. Bingo. Every single one. I hit select all and send, and everybody gets that email. I don't care if you're good, you're bad. It's just, it's, it's at that point, it's PR. It's just spreading the word about the program. How many of those 1,103 athletes got an actual hard copy letter in the mail uh, that had a questionnaire inside where they could fill it out and some information about the school? How many got that? All of them. You got them sharp. All of them. Did I stuff those envelopes? No. I have work study girls, 18 year old girls that come into the office late at night and stuff envelopes and put stamps on them. And I wanted every athlete to get something in the mail. You know, because nowadays everything's on a computer or whatever. So I wanted them to get something in the mail. So everybody got a letter. Whether you're good, you're bad, ugly, whatever. Everybody's getting a letter. How many of those 1,103 athletes? Uh, did we send an email requesting them to send us their video? F. Anyone else? Lori, you're right. All of them. Every last one. I'm going to ask for the video. Doesn't mean I'm necessarily going to watch it or whatever, but I'm going to ask for it. I'm just going to see who gives it back to me. When I get the videos back, you know who's watching those videos? At a small school, sometimes as players on the team, work study people, I would hand my work, or you know, show in, in my day, uh, I would give them a stack of DVDs to a work study, a, a 20 year old work study guy, and say, watch these DVDs and tell me if you like somebody in there. I would get stacks and stacks, hundreds, hundreds of DVDs, and I would give them, tell them to watch them. But I'm asking every single one for them. Now here's another, here's a tricky one for you. How many of these 1,103 athletes got a letter? that said, dear, what's your name? Dear Bailey, we've been watching your progress this year from afar, and we're really interested in you as a potential cougar. We'd like to get a better look at you to see if you're a good fit for our program. The best way that we can look at you is to invite you to our Elite Skills Showcase Camp on June 10th to 17th. How many people got that letter? <laughs> what? Yes, it's revenue to the store. It's revenue, right? And if you come to camp, you're on my campus, I get a chance to get to know you, and if you happen to be really good, 
then I might recruit you. If you're awful and you're kicking the ball around like I used to do on the ground, you just paid 575 bucks for camp, I'm making half of that. When I, one of the places that I worked was a school in Nebraska, and they, when they hired me, they told me that my salary was $50,000. I said, hey, that's cool, sounds, sounds good. You know, for, for, um, for the job I had before, that was a salary bump for me. Well, when I got there, I found out my salary actually was $25,000. The other 25 was camp revenue, assuming I made $25,000 in camp revenue. If half of my job, half of my income, is contingent on getting certain kids to come to camp, I'm spending a lot of time making sure that you're coming to camp. You know the easiest way to get you to come to camp? Tell you I'm recruiting you, <laughs> right? Tell you I'm recruiting you and you can come to camp. So it doesn't mean that camp invites are bad, but it also doesn't mean that camp invites are a scholarship ball. That make sense? So, what happens is a lot of kids will get invites to camp, invites to campus visits, or they'll get letters from being at these big showcase tournaments and they say, I'm set, I'm set, you know, recruiting, I'm good, I'm good. You're not good until you have offers in writing, or at least really good offers verbally, because you can't get offers in writing until a certain <laughs> time frame, uh, but younger athletes can get serious recruiting. And sometimes you might be thinking to yourself, some of you guys might be thinking, well, you know, in the recruiting process right now, am I good? Am I, how, uh, if you, that's going through your head right now, if you have to ask yourself, you're not. <laughs> right? If you, if some kids are like, how do I know if I'm a Division I player? The Division I player doesn't have to ask that question because they already know. Because Division I coaches are talking to them and telling them that they're a Division I player. Does that make sense? The last thing I want to do today is crush anyone's dreams. That's not what it's about. I want our clients to have dreams and aspirations, but more important than that, I want them to have plan B, plan C, plan D, plan E, plan F, plan G. Because when they have all those options, uh, not one thing is they're gonna make sure they have a place to play. If that's what they wanna do is play lacrosse in college and have a place, they're also gonna save money. Because the more options you have, the better chance you have to get a great financial aid package. Uh, so okay, so how many of these 1,103 um, athletes did um, did I call on the phone? Five hundred. Anyone else? Yeah, maybe. You know, it's not an exact. Sound. Maybe two or three hundred. Uh, now, every kid I call, if I call them on the phone, you know what I'm trying to do when I call them? Narrow them down. I'm trying to have a conversation with a kid and say, I don't like that because I want to get my list down to a smaller number so that maybe I invite those on a personal visit or something like that. How many of the 1,103 did I send them a, a personal email that said, dear, you know, first name, so I inserted their name, dear name, I'd like to invite you and your family to come down for a visit day uh, on Saturday. We're gonna give you a tour of campus in the morning. We're gonna give you free lunch in the cafeteria and you and all your family members and friends are going to have free tickets to our lacrosse game or basketball game in the afternoon. How many people got that email? 10 to 15. 10 to 15. 4? 1,103. Because it's people getting on campus to see the school because my salary, believe it or not, is housed underneath the admissions office at a lot of schools. Lacrosse is the fastest growing sport in the United States as far as number of colleges that add a sport. Do you know why? Two reasons. Number one, it's a really cool sport. Fastest sport on two feet. It's a really you know, popular, cool sport. The other, probably more important reason, it's a really good way to increase the enrollment of the school. Especially on the women's side. Get 50 girls in, get, uh, schools make money. Believe it or not, schools are businesses. Believe it or not, they have somebody running the admissions office that's in charge of balancing the bottom line. And by having a lacrosse team, is a good way to get a lot more people into this school. So that's one of the reasons it's a very fast growing sport. So with me being a coach, I am underneath the umbrella of admissions and I report to people. I have bosses just like all of you have bosses. And my bosses are telling me, we want you to bring a lot of people in on campus visits. So what do I do? I have these visit days. 
Uh, not only that, it's four or five more people in the stands cheering for us. If we're at a small school, if you went to a, a Mount Olive game or a Catawba game or a Wingate game, they probably weren't packed full of stands. <laughs> so if I can get five or six people cheering for us, that's good. That's a good thing. Uh, it doesn't mean I'm recruiting you. Now, how do you know if you're getting recruited? Well, some of it's so obvious. If, they're, if you're getting a phone call every single week, you know, a Division One, Division Two schools can call you once a week, you know, after your junior year. Um, that's maybe one good way. Uh, you know, you're getting their call, and you know, you'll know. You'll know. Um, here's what I did for two of those recruits in that class of 2008. For one of them, I went to 20 of his 25 games his senior year. So I had my spot in the bleachers. I knew where his parents were going to sit. It was a 6'9 kid from Triton High School, this is, you know, four or five years ago. Um, I was at 20 of his games. Another kid, uh, we flew in and we paid for his flight to fly in from Miami. And I we were the Monarchs at Methodist, so they had a Monarchs so a big lion. So the uh, the uh, cheerleaders had a Monarch costume. I took the costume, I borrowed it from the cheerleaders, wore it to the airport, had a sign with his name on it, and greeted him as he got off the plane, you know, with, with his name, and here's me in a big monarch costume. So my point is, there's a difference between those two kids and the other 1,101. How many of those 1,103 do you think I knew their name? Ten. Yeah, maybe 20 or 30, depending on how good my memory is, right? Maybe at, at most 20 or 30. So the point is, what is recruiting? It's different levels. How many of you guys are getting letters in the mail from colleges right now? Good. Getting letters is better than not getting letters. If you're not getting letters, it means the coaches don't even know who you are at this point. If you are getting letters, then you're somewhere in the funnel. And how I think about recruiting, from my point of view as a college coach, is I'm funneling kids through to figure out who I want to eventually recruit more seriously. So your role, of, your getting letters means you're in the funnel. Now the hard part is to navigate through the funnel to make sure that you get those offers at the end. Make sense? Awesome. So that third part is to have a, or third most common thing to have a false sense of security. Um, I'm going to talk about one more thing there, and I'm going to turn it over to Bob for the last two, actually. You guys in lacrosse is one of those sports where uh, the tournaments and the club teams are really important, right? Obviously, you guys are all on a club team, correct? Uh, in lacrosse, because it's a somewhat regional sport where it's very popular in small segments of the country and, and, and not as um, blanket widespread as others, Lacrosse is a little unique in that there's these big tournaments that everybody has to go to to get recruited. What's a big tournament that you guys have played in recently? Charlotte has one? Where is that? Pennsylvania? Okay. So a lot of people think, well, for me to get recruited, what I need to do is I need to go and play in these big showcase events in front of coaches and then in the movies, right? You're going to be out there doing your thing, and then after the game, the coach comes down from the stands, shakes your hand, what's your name? Mason. Mason, I'm Coach Ryerson. You look great out there, son. I'd like to offer you a scholarship. Right? That's how it happens, right? It doesn't happen like that. That happens in the movies. Here's how it really happens. What's the name of that tournament in Pennsylvania? G-A-I-T. G-A-I-G-T. Gates. G-I-I-T. Okay. Gates. Gates. Sorry. That he's, a famous a play. he's a famous player. Oh, Gary okay. Gates. Gary Gates. I made it way more confusion than I needed to. <laughs> the Gate right. Cup. So if I'm getting ready to go to the Gate Cup to recruit, and again, my best friend's a, a women's lacrosse coach, so I know exactly his travel schedule in the summer and where he's going and how he would do this, very similar to how you would do it in basketball. Uh, I'm not going to go to the gate cup, get a lawn chair, sit down, put my hat on, and just start watching lacrosse. Who's that kid? Oh, he's good? Oh, that kid scored a goal. I'm going to recruit him. I'm not going to do that. You know why? Too many kids there. How many, how many fields are going on at that tournament? 
15, 20 fields at one time. So for me to do that would be really silly because it's not very efficient use of my time. I could be watching a game and really like a kid and come to find out that that kid already assigned with a Division One school. Or I could be watching a game and really like a kid and find out that that kid has a 1.6 GPA and just stabbed his girlfriend last week. So I'm not going to waste my time evaluating somebody until I first know more about him. I'm going to narrow down the recruiting process and then I'm going to specifically go to watch that athlete. Here's how I would do that as a college coach. I call or email the people in charge of the game cup. I ask them to send me, or a lot of times now it's online, you can access the rosters. I get the rosters. I take my database of 1,103 kids, and which is uh, you know an Excel spreadsheet type database, I export it. I get the rosters of the Gate Cup, and I do what's called a cross-reference, and I see who's going to be there that is also already in my database. Then I do a secondary cross-reference, and I say, okay, of that list, who has above a 3.5 GPA? Because if you don't have a 3.5 GPA or better, and I'm at a small private Division III school where I'm not giving athletic scholarship money, I gotta be able to get you to afford the school, so you gotta have good grades. And let's say after I do those two cross-reference checks, I'm left with 26 players that are on both lists. Who do you think I'm going to Pennsylvania to watch? I'm going to watch those 26 kids. Those 26 kids. I map out a schedule, okay? I'm gonna get there Friday night, stay at the Holiday Inn, Saturday morning, I'm going to field two. I'm going to watch Joe at 8 o'clock. At 8.30, I'm moving over to field four. I'm going to watch Mark on this team. At 9 o'clock, I'm moving over to this field. And I have it mapped out each game or who I'm going to watch. What's the problem here? I'm over here watching Mark. You're over there seven fields away having the game of your life. <laughs> Nobody's there to see it because nobody knows who you are. Now, I'm not naive enough to say that I never, what I call, randomly recruited somebody. What is randomly recruited? It means I'm there watching Mark, and he, you know, say he's a midi or something, he's going head-to-head -head with somebody else, and that guy's destroying him, and he's a thousand times better player. And I go to the guy next to me, who's that guy? And then he tells me who he is, and then maybe I start recruiting that guy, right? And there's probably the fastest player there. So at the Gates Cup, you probably saw some fast guys. There was one guy who was the absolute fastest. That guy probably got randomly recruited. There was probably a guy there who was the best player, right? You remember one of the best players? Or, you know, That guy probably got randomly recruited. People found out about him just because he was there. So there's really two ways, and that's the scenario I just laid out for you. There's really two ways to get recruited. Be good enough to be one of those four or five guys that get noticed on their own, or get on the coach's list before you show up for the event, right? So get your information to the coach, get your video to the coach, get through the funnel so that when they do the cross-reference check, your name pops up and they go to watch you at your specific time. Now, there's more to it than that. When they show up to watch you, you gotta be good enough and they, they gotta like you, and you know, there's a lot more to it than just, than just getting them your information. But if you never take those first steps, you can end up wasting a lot of time and a lot of money. A lot of people, when I say that, will say, you know, maybe think, well, why are we spending all this money on club teams and on travel and everything if this is how coaches recruit? Couldn't we get, couldn't we just communicate directly with coaches and get them our video? Well, yeah, there's some truth to that. But of course, in a sport like lacrosse, your club team and being at these events is really important. The way that I look at it, it's a cart before the horse kind of thing. Going up to Pennsylvania, driving up there, playing in the tournament, being on the club team, is important, but it's only valuable if you do the legwork ahead of time, right? So if you do the work ahead of time to connect with the coaches, to establish your relationships with these college coaches, then they'll be much more valuable for you to be there. Coaches will come to watch you. That makes sense? Awesome. So that is um, having a big ego, false sense of security. Bob's gonna take over the last two and then I'm gonna come back at the end, we'll wrap it up and we'll do a little Q&A. Y'all getting some good information tonight. Um, thank y'all for coming. The fourth mistake that a lot of parents and families make is waiting too late to get started 
in this process. I think it's great that you guys are getting letters. Now, some of you guys are, are in your senior year, right? Are you getting phone calls from any coaches at this point? Anybody? Okay, that's a good way to tell kind of where you are in the recruiting process. The mistake that people make a lot of times is they think, hey, I'm going to have a great showcase tournament this summer before my senior year. All these coaches are going to find out about me. They're going to start calling me. Everything's going to work out fine. Or they might think, hey, I'm going to have a great senior season. I'm going to be an all-state player. Then I'm going to get all these offers coming in. And you know what? That's too late a lot of times to wait that long. You, like Tim was saying, a lot, a lot of what you have to do is be proactive in this process. You can't just sit back and wait for it to happen. I mean, the All-Americans, you know, the superstars, maybe they can do that. But most kids out there can't just sit back and wait for the opportunities to come to them. And you need to get started as soon as possible, no matter where you are, what year. It's, it's never too early to get started. Um, out of the 500 or so colleges out there, you know, the top of the line colleges are going to find kids very, very early in their career. They start recruiting kids when they're, when they're freshmen and sophomores. You're getting in that funnel at that point. Okay? And you can't just sit back and wait for this to happen. I mean, I've, I don't have a lacrosse background. I don't have a picture of myself in college. <laughs> I don't even know if they had lacrosse back when I was in college. But it was, uh, I've, I've actually helped about 260 families through the recruiting process over about five years. And that's a very common mistake. It just it goes along with the ego part of it, thinking, you know, my kid's good enough, he's going to get noticed. You have to get started as early as possible. You have to be proactive and get in every, every funnel that you can get in out there, as many colleges as you can. I can't tell you how many families I've talked to when a student athlete is a, is a sophomore. They say, they give me that deal to say, hey, people are going to be fine. He's going to get all, all the notice out there. We're going to all these tournaments. He's, he's a great player. He's going to get recruited. And then comes this time of their senior year, and they're not getting the phone calls. They're not getting the letters. And then they need our help. You know, it's not too late to get started as a senior in a service like ours. But the earlier you start, the better. It's just a big mistake. Unless, like I say, you're at the very, very top level. It's a mistake to not get started as soon as you can. It's a huge mistake that people make. Um, and we, by, by using something like what we do, it's a great way to get exposure to as many colleges as possible. And even if you are a really, really good player, it's a great thing to do because this is a numbers game. You know, as, as Tim mentioned, he starts out with 1,100 kids to get down to sign in four. It's a numbers game. You have to be, you have to play the game. You have to get in as many recruiting funnels as possible to increase your odds of finding the right school. So that's a mistake that people make. Get started as soon as you can and, and open yourself up to as many schools as you can. There's, there's a lot of opportunities out there, but you have to be proactive about it. The uh, fifth mistake that families make is they expect their coach to do everything for them and find them a school. You're shaking your head. <laughs> that happens. Coaches are great. I love them. We work with them all the time. You know, the club coaches are great. The high school coaches are great. But they, you know, they have full-time jobs, a lot of them, and they, they have other things to do, other things besides helping you all day long find the right school. They, and uh, now, coaches may have a lot of contacts with colleges. A lot of high school coaches, they might know, you know, 10, 15, 20 club coaches might know 40 or 50 college coaches at the most. But you know, that's that's another 450 or so that they don't know. So you can't just depend on them to help you all the way through the process. They can be very beneficial to you, and a lot of times when you are being recruited, the college coach will call your high school or club coach and get a reference on you and ask about you. So it's very important to keep a good relationship with them, and, 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 but you just can't expect them to do all this work for you. They have other things to do. This is one of the most important things in your life, is to find the right school, to find the right college. It might not be as important to your coach. And a lot of them mean well, a lot of them do a great job, but you just can't depend on them to do all this for you. You can utilize some of their relationships. That's a good place to start in this process. But there are just so many more colleges out there that your coaches are, are not familiar with. You've got to use every resource you can to help you find the right school. Does that make sense? OK, I'm going to turn this back over to OK, thanks, Bob. Awesome. So uh, those are the five most important things. Uh, 
how many of you, when you came here tonight, were curious or interested in the financial aid aspect of college athletic retreat? Anybody? Cool. Before we get to the Q&A then, I just want to finish up by talking a little bit about financial aid packaging and I'll give you a little bit of advice and guidance on how that works, specifically at smaller schools, Division II schools, Division III schools, NAI schools, even the lower level of Division I. Um, so one of the really common things, and you probably already know this already, in a sport like lacrosse, a full scholarship is very, very, very rare. You know that, right? So let's say a school, the NCAA, do anyone know the NCAA limit for Division One Or number of scholarships? For lacrosse? Yeah. I think it's like 13, 14. Yeah, you know the Division Two number? I believe the Division Two number is nine. So the, it is nine. So the NCAA says, we allow you to give nine scholarships. How many athletes do you think are on a Division Two lacrosse team on average? 30. 30? Yeah, probably 30 or more. Because in college you have red shirts, gray shirts, green shirts, injured reserve, um, you know, academically ineligible. You, just, you have a lot of more people on your roster than maybe you even see at a game. So it's probably 30 or more. So the nine scholarships, they don't come off the scholarship tree, right? The school actually has to find the money to fund those scholarships. Most of these schools, the Division II, Division III, even the small Division I schools, are not raking in the money like Duke is. Duke doesn't have any problem funding their 13 full scholarships for Division I. All those kids are going to get a full ride, the 13, or if they break it up, you know, the 26 kids are getting, you know, a half, each of them is getting a half. Division II level, in the state of North Carolina, the average school gives out the equivalent of three or four scholarships. Because it being the word fully funded means that they fund the full amount of scholarships that are allowed. No school around here is fully funded for lacrosse. Because lacrosse isn't a sport that's packing in the stands, bringing in millions of dollars every Saturday, right? So it's losing money. So they're not, in a business, you don't give money to something that is losing you money. Uh, and don't be offended by that, because almost every single sport loses money other than at the big schools, football and men's basketball. Uh, so, if they have the equivalent of three or four scholarships and they're giving out uh, scholarships to as many as 30 or 40 kids, that means the average athlete is on what e what's the equivalent of a one-tenth of a scholarship. So here's what they do to make you seem, uh, can I borrow this for a second? to make you seem like they really want you. They're going to have you sign something called the NLI. You know what that stands for? The NLI is the National Letter of Intent. The National Letter of Intent is in the Holly Springs Sun, is that the name of the paper, where they have the picture of the guy sitting at the table, and he's putting a hat on to go to Wingate, or he's putting a hat on to go to Lenore Rhine, and there's a big article that says, you know, Tommy Smith signs a scholarship to Lenore Rhine. He's signing a national letter of intent. And in that national letter of intent, if Lenore Ryan costs $30,000 a year, and he is an average lacrosse student that's getting an average scholarship, so this is very typical, he's getting the equivalent of one-tenth of that in scholarship. So he's getting a $3,000 scholarship. So they'll give an NLI, and it'll say, you know, year one, 3K, year two, 3K, for a total of $12,000. Your AD has a signing ceremony for you, you, you sign it, smile at the newspaper, they take your picture, you put the hat on, you take this NLI, make a photocopy of it, put it on your Facebook page, <laughs> show all the girls, your dad goes to work, tells all his buddies, my kid just got a scholarship, going D2, going D2, right? Um, and you should be proud, because you know what? There's not a lot of schools out there that have lacrosse teams, only 300 or so total in the entire nation. Uh, there's not a lot of kids that get lacrosse scholarships, and all of your hard work paid off, and you got a lacrosse scholarship. I'm not diminishing that. You should be very proud. I played Division Three basketball very, very poorly. I wasn't good enough to get a scholarship for athletics. Uh, there aren't many kids that are. Uh, so, you did. You get this official letter. Your parents get another official letter. 
It's called the tuition bill. 30,000 minus three for lacrosse equals 27,000. So I don't really call a scholarship, I don't use the word scholarship. I use the term that it really is. It's a discount. It's a percentage off of the sale. So who in here is a, is a, uh, is a shopper? Who loves to shop? Anyone? So my mom's a shopper, all right? When I, I mean, her favorite stores are TJ Maxx and Marshalls and Hobby Lobby and you know stores like this, the deal stores, right? Good stuff at a great deal. So I can remember a time um, when I was a kid and my mom would come home with a very large, expensive mirror. And she would walk in the door and you know the first thing she would say? She'd say, I got this for 80% off. Or I saved $800 on this mirror. What do you think my dad and I said to her? <laughs> How much was it? What'd you pay for it? And then she said, well, it was $200. But it originally was 1000 But I got it for 200 Me and my dad would look at each other and say, you just paid $200 for a mirror? You know, and how much is that mirror worth? I don't know. Maybe it really is a thousand dollar mirror, and maybe it really is a good price, and you got it for a great deal. But maybe it was a mirror that cost them two hundred seventy-five dollars, and they marked it up a lot, and then they discounted it a lot to get you to buy. There's three numbers in play: starting cost, the percentage or number of discount, and the bottom line price. When it comes to your child's education, which is the most important number? Bottom line price. So when a client comes to me and says, Tim, we're really excited. Um, John qualified for $8,000 presidential scholarship. He just got awarded an $8,000 scholarship. You know what I say back to them? I don't care about the $8,000. What's your bottom line price? Because if it started at nine, if the school cost $9,000 and you just got an $8,000 scholarship, great deal. If school started at $60,000 and you just got an $8,000 scholarship, man, congratulations, but I'm not as impressed. Because what you got is a 5% off. Have you ever walked into a retail store and didn't see something on sale? There's always something on sale, right? There's a clearance rack or a discount rack, or you can always, you know, you can't go to Bed Bath and be honest, you're always gonna get 20% off, always, right? It's just a standard discount off of what you buy. The same thing happens in the college education. One of the things you wanna make sure you don't do is you don't wanna have sticker shock. What sticker shock means is you go on a website and you click on admission, tuitions and fees, and you see that it costs $45,000 a year. And then you say to yourself, I don't have $180,000 to pay for college, so we can't look at this school. I need to go to a, NC, a North Carolina State public school because they're cheap. Well, hold on here. What's the average price of a North Carolina State public school? Yeah, yeah, about nineteen thousand dollars. Now, one of the big myths, and I'm not from North Carolina, and a lot of people that grew up here, it's sort of one of those things that perpetuated, and of course, is perpetuated by teachers who probably went to those schools, right? Because uh, no offense to teachers, I was a teacher myself. A lot of people don't go to Johns Hopkins or Emory and become a teacher. They go to an NC State school, get a teaching degree, certification in that state, become a teacher, and then tell kids you should go to this school because it's a great state school. I'm not knocking public state schools. There's some really good ones. But they're not a really good deal in North Carolina. They're pretty expensive, to be honest. Uh, private schools, a school like Methodist where I worked at, or lots of the, you know, the Roanoke's, the Emory and Henry's, the Randolph Macon's, the, the uh, Lynchburg colleges, a lot of those sticker prices are 40 grand and up. Most of the kids going to those schools are going for the same or less than they'd go to an NC State school for. You don't know how much a school costs until you have a piece of paper in your hand that says starting price, discount, academic discount, athletic discount, financial need discount, other scholarship discount, and then you have a bottom line price, this is what it costs. I will not let somebody tell me a school is too expensive until I see that piece of paper. If you tell yourself, I'm not gonna look at that school because it's too expensive, you're doing yourself a huge disservice because you just don't know. I've seen firsthand, Methodist University's 36 grand a year now, probably 20 kids that I recruited went for free. For flat out free, didn't pay a dollar. Lots and lots of kids went for five grand, 10 grand, 15 grand, and so on. Maybe a kid here or there who's you know, a 1.8 GPA who's 
whose parents are filthy rich and you know is just like an awful kid. Maybe that kid's paying thirty grand, but very, very, very. Few. That's basketball, though. Basketball is a full revenue sport. There, right? No scholarship money for athletics. So it doesn't matter if you're a basketball player or not. It's just so like most schools, you have basketball and football, they usually get full rides. For, for Division One, Division Two, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, for Division One, for Division Two, it's probably half and half. Half are fully funded, and half are in the same boat as lacrosse. Believe it or not, a lot of Division Two basketball schools, especially in the Southeast, are in the same position as lacrosse is because they're not making money either. You know, Mount Olive, Wingate, Catawba, they're not making money on basketball either. Um, but you're right, probably about the higher levels of Division One. Um, so if, if college wanted your son. Yeah, that's a great question, and let's just use that to transition right into the Q and A section. So we'll use that as the sort of the first question. So that's a really good question. How does financial aid packaging work? Is the coach involved in it, or? Is admissions, or what if you're a good player? Does that help you get more athletic money than if you're not a good player? Right? Those are some. And the answer is really a gray area. It's really not cut and dry. And every school is a little bit different. NCAA Division three schools do not give any scholarship for athletics. So technically, according to the NCAA rule book, your athletic ability should have zero influence over how much money you get academically and how much money you get need-based. Technically, there are schools where your athletic ability has a huge influence over how much money you get academically and how much money you get um, need-based. I had a, a client from Florida who went through the a great client. He did everything we asked him to. He educated himself. He was really, really good. His son is now playing at uh, Luther College in Iowa. Um, he asked me after the process, he goes, Tim, I learned so much about financial aid, but I, what I really found interesting is that some of the Division three schools we were working with, the coach said, come through me, I'm going to help you get a good financial aid package when it comes to academics and it comes to need. And other coaches told me, we have nothing to do with financial aid, it, it is it's a separate thing, like, you, you know, you have to go to missions to get financial aid. And they would say, it's against the rules for us to be you know, in this thing. And he goes, but I didn't really get it. Like, are there two sections of Division Three, Or like, how come some can and how come some can't? And how come, how do you know which ones can and which ones can't? And I thought, I thought about that. Well, that's a really good question. And I thought about it for a second and said, I know how you know which ones can. You go to NCAA.com and you look at the rankings and all the teams that are ranked really high in the nation, they can. <laughs> All the teams that are really bad, they can't. Because it's a gray area. Now, when I was a coach, two of the, uh, at Methodist University, uh, two of my favorite people that I had lunch with, talked to a lot, were Rick Lowe and Jamie Lay. One was the director of admission, and one was the president, or vice president for enrollment. Why were those two guys, two of my best friends there? They were cool dudes, and I like them. One of them actually lives in Hot Springs. Uh, the other reason is they decided who gets in and how much money they get. So it was really important for me to have a good relationship with them. So I could not, as a coach, walk down to, to their office, the vice president, and say, Rick, give this guy a scholarship for academics that's better than what you gave him because he's really good at basketball. I couldn't do that. But I could walk down and say, you know, Rick, wink, wink, how's that Tyler scholarship looking? Uh, you know, he was, he was just voted pre class president, and, you know, he also plays tennis on the side, and, you know, he's uh, really involved with, the, um, with church stuff, and, you know, he's an Eagle Scout. He's looking at this other school. Anything else we can do? And then maybe, hey, he gets a financial aid package next week with $4,000 additional scholarship. Wink, wink. Did I have some influence? Yeah. Do, now... Other schools might have more influence than I had, and, and so on. So there's there's a lot of gray area there. Look at it from the college coach's point of, or from the college's point of view. So follow me on this exercise because I think it's really cool. If you're a college, a small college, not a state-funded college like 
UNC Pembroke, but a small college like Elon, or a small college like um, Hampton Sydney or Randolph Macon. Where does your revenue come from? How do you make money as a school? Anybody know where the bulk of your revenue comes from? Tuition is one part of it. The bigger part is alumni endowed scholarships. So tuition is what people are paying, right? The other part of it is rich people who die who give money back to the school, right? So Princeton and Harvard, these schools, they basically, what they do is they invest into bright minds, educate them, they go off and be millionaires, they die, they give money back to the school. This money goes into a big pot. This endowed scholarship uh, means, it, say it's $50 million. It kicks out in interest every year a million dollars. And that million dollars funds the scholarships that they use to bring bright minds into the school to keep the cycle going. If you're not Princeton or Harvard and you don't have this endowed scholarship $50 million pot, your goal is to get it or to grow it, to grow your endowment so that you can afford to have a school. If you don't have a big endowment, you're what's called a tuition-driven school. Uh, now in our book, and I told you I was going to talk about student afterwards, but I'm going to put a shameless plug in. These books are for sale for $20 tonight. They're 30 on the website. You get a great deal tonight here in person. One of the chapters in here is, I believe chapter 16, is how to leverage a tuition-driven school. Chapter 16, how to leverage a tuition-driven school. This is one of the best chapters in this book. This alone is going to save you lots and lots of money. How that works is a, uh, a tuition-driven school, let's say they normally bring in about 400 athletes a year, or 400 students a year to their school uh, in their freshman class. If they bring in 390, people are getting fired. Job, people are losing jobs. We're cutting back on maintenance. We're cutting back on facilities because the actual money from this tuition is not there. If we have 410, people are getting raises. That's how close it is at tuition-driven school. You don't want to be a tuition-driven school, right? Because you, you know, what's the answer there? Just let a lot of people into your school. Let anybody come. Well, you let anybody come, your academic rating goes down, and now the good students are never going to come there. And how you want to be this school that has a big endowment means you want to have really good students. So what you want to do is you want to be selective, but you also got to balance the budget. So it's a very, it's walking a tightrope. So what you need to do in the recruiting process is to convince the school that you are worth them taking a chance on. Because what is this? There's three parts working together. Okay, on one side there is the admissions office. What is the admissions office most concerned about in recruiting athletes? Do you know? Anybody have a guess? The admissions counselors? Bingo. They're looking for high SAT and high GPA. Have any of you guys ever been on Princeton uh, World, uh, Princeton Review or US World News Report looking up colleges? And they're giving you something that's called an uh, average SAT score or a um, average GPA, and they're ranking these colleges. It's very, very important to the admissions office that the average SAT and GPA is going up every year. Because then they're doing a good job and they're getting races and doing well. There's another segment that is somebody that's balancing the budget. So that's the CEO of finance or the vice president or whatever. What are they most concerned about? Paying customers, <laughs> Paying customers enrollment, filling the dorm rooms. I think of a college, especially a small college, like a cruise ship or an airplane or a hotel. On a cruise ship, if you go at the very last minute, you might be able to get a good deal. Why? Because that ship's leaving, we've already paid the gas, and if that bunk is empty, we're losing money. Mm -hmm. If we give you 99 bucks a night, and we know you're going to buy some booze on the ship or something, we're still going to make a little bit more money. On an airplane, you ever sit on an airplane and wonder what everyone was paying? They're all paid different prices, right, because of supply and demand. If you're a small college, you're... The, the teacher's uh, professor's fees are already paid, the lights, the electric bill's getting paid, whether or not that classroom is full or that classroom is empty. So if you can be a beating heartbeat that's gonna pay some dollars and come to school, uh, that's value there. Now there's a, what's called a discount rate. So let's say a school costs $30,000, their discount rate 
is sort of a do not go below rate. Let's say that's 11,000. That means that as long as you're paying more than 11,000, we're making money off of you. So if it's late or they're having a hard time filling their class and you're somebody that maybe could take that spot, then you might get a great deal. I'll talk more about that in a second. The third part is the, the lacrosse coach. What do you think they're looking for? Good yeah, good lacrosse players. And probably also good students too, because good students are a lot easier to coach. You don't have to worry about study hall, you don't have to worry about them. You don't have to worry about investing a year, training them and teaching them, and then having them flunk out. Mm -hmm. So if you are a good student with a high SAT and a GPA, a good lacrosse player, and a warm body that can pay a little bit of tuition, all three of these people are working together and they all want you, right? If you're one but not the other, let's say you're a great lacrosse player but your academics are pretty suspect, you know, then they're fighting each other. Because the lacrosse coach is saying, I want this guy who's really good, and the admissions office is like, well, he doesn't really raise our average SAT score, so you know, we're not gonna wheel and deal to get him a better price. If you, what your job then as student athletes should be is to develop strong relationships with admissions, financial aid, and the college coach to all kind of work together so that they're all working on your side so that you can get a great deal when it comes to the price. The, the phrase that I always told uh, kids that I was recruiting was, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And it was always the moms. The moms that came in there and said, um, you know, ask, 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 ask for more. When they give you a price, ask for more. Get another offer from another school. Leverage it with that one. They, let's say they put an offer out there and say, okay, bottom line price is $14,000. A lot of people say, all right, we gotta come up with 14,000. You know what I say? Go get some other school to give you an offer for nine. Come back and say, I'm going here for nine. Play ball. And they might say, no. And then, you know, so what? At least you ask. You, your goal is to, to negotiate that price as low as possible. I talked a long way there. So that, that all makes sense. I went from here to there and tried to tie it all back together. One question about that. Yeah. Do you dare tell them that you need financial aid up front, or is that like a, oh, you know, they don't want to mess with you because you're, you're going to be. So there's two types of financial aid. There is there's financial aid that comes from the federal government that you can use at any school. Right. So that's Pell Grant, Stafford Loan, Work Study Money. Most families say, um, well, we're not even gonna mess with that because we make too much money to qualify for any financial aid. And you probably do, because that income level is pretty low to, to qualify for that free money. But then the other part of financial aid is individual money that you can use at that individual school. Have you heard of the FAFSA before? Has anyone filled that out, the FAFSA? Free application for federal student aid. The reason why that's really important, and a lot of people don't fill it out, and they, they should, and you need to. Because when you fill out the FAFSA, they're gonna give you something that's called the EFC, an Estimated Family Contribution. That is the government saying, we think you can afford X amount of dollars to pay for school. Now, you may not agree with that number, but the government is coming up with this number. Uh, so let's say, hypothetically, your EFC is $17,000. The government thinks, we think your family, based on your taxes, your, um, your income per year, your, um, you know, holdings or, you know, whatever, real estate, we think you can afford 17000 If you go to a school that costs twenty five, their goal, basically, is to try to get you down into that 17000 range. That's what's called in, in admissions, it's called meeting your need. We've met the family's need if we get them down to around seventeen. Now, if the school costs forty five, their goal is to get you down to around seventeen. If the school costs 60, their goal is to get you down around 17. So it really doesn't matter where you start, it matters where you end up. So your question was, would you basically be turning off a school if you told them that you needed financial aid because they want to make more money by getting somebody that can pay full price? Not at all. Because the people in admissions don't care about the people in financial aid. The people in admissions want bright students and they also want uh, quality individuals that are going to increase, that are going to make the school a better place. It's not just about SAT and GPA, it's about your personality. 
It's about, are you going to come into, camp, into campus and you're going to be a leader on campus and you're going to make the school better? If you can portray that to the admissions office, they're going to fight for you. They don't care about what your financial aid package is. They want to get the best kids into the school. Um, a lot of schools, the elite academic schools, Harvard and Princeton kind of started this, and a lot of schools now that are maybe in that second tier are starting to award aid, and they're taking um, need out of the equation. So they're not, they're, so they're, they're, I'm sorry, they're awarding admission, and they're, it's called blind admission. It means that they're not gonna let how much aid a kid needs influence who gets into the school. It's a very noble thing to do because the, 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 the money side of it would say, well, this kid's paying full price, but he's a worse student, so we're gonna take him. If you do that once or twice, all of a sudden it becomes a chain and your school gets lower in, in, in your standing or whatever. So a lot of schools are going to what's called blind admission, which means they keep it totally separate. They don't even let the, the admissions council see that actual aid. But there are some schools where it does become a factor. My advice would be absolutely be upfront from the beginning. Be upfront with how much you can afford to pay for school and what kind of deal you need to get. Um, it is no different, when you're going into admissions office, it is no different than buying a used car. When you go in to buy a used car, the guy on the other side, he is your enemy, right? He wants to sell that car for as much as possible. You want to buy it for the least amount possible and you're probably gonna meet somewhere in the middle. And that guy has been buying, selling cars for 20 years and he knows all the tricks, and you come in uneducated, don't really know how it works, he's probably gonna win. Now, he can really win if he can win without knowing, with you thinking that you also won. That's the goal, right? So these guys are really good at it. So because of that, you wanna be really educated. The worst thing you would do is you would walk up to a car dealership and say, I'm ready to buy a car today. I actually have to check with me. I'm not gonna look at any other car dealerships. I'm gonna buy it from you. Can I have a good deal? I mean, he's, he's sitting there li licking his chops. He's like, I got this one, right? You wanna come into that car dealership and say, you know what? I'm interested in what you have to offer. Um, I'm gonna check out these other four places today as well, and you know, I'm gonna come back, and um, you, know, you can do whatever you need to do to let that guy know that you're gonna be a smart consumer, right? You're gonna be a smart consumer. It doesn't mean you're going to fight them. It doesn't mean you're going to see them as your enemy, but you are going to, uh, you're going to get a great deal because you're educated and you understand how the process works. Does that make sense? Sure. Awesome. I'm talking way too much, so I want to let you guys ask the questions that you've been waiting to ask all night, and hopefully Bob and I can, can answer them for you. What, uh, what questions do you have? Is the average of one-tenth of a, of a scholarship for the cross? Is that an average, or is there, is there a percentage that's an average I guess it depends on the division too. Right? Yeah, so here's how that works. So let's say a college has five scholarships to give out. And, you know, they can break those up however they want. So they technically could give five full rides. Now sometimes their school has restrictions on like how much in one kid could get. So a lot of schools, uh, Division two schools for example, they'll only be able to give like the maximum would be like a 75% of a full ride. Uh, but let's leave that out for now. Hypothetically, the coach could say, I'm going to give five full rides, and then I'm going to try to find 25 players to walk on. Well, in lacrosse, you need probably 15 or 16 pretty good players, right? You need a full, full front line and your full defense. If you just got five good players and got them on full rides, you'd be really weak in a couple areas. So what you're going to do is you're going to break that up. Maybe a really good player gets a half scholarship. Maybe somebody else just gets like $1,000. Maybe somebody else gets a quarter. Um, the point is, the, coach, the coach's goal is to get you to commit with the least amount of scholarship given, right? So what is actually the coach's goal? Get as many quality players as he can. For the least money. amount? For yeah. his money. How much does he want to give your son? And if, if, to still get him, how much would he, would he like to give him? Only as much as he has. Ideally, best case scenario, zero. There's a really cool term for that. You've probably heard it, right? Walk on. They want you to walk on. Now, coaches are, you know, 
they're sharp, so they come up with all different fancy names. We're going to call you a gray shirt, or a green shirt, or a black shirt, or a red shirt. And we're going to call you a preferred walk-on, or we're going to call you an invited walk-on. You've heard those terms, right? The movies glorify the term walk-on. Right? If there's ever a kid at Carolina that started as a walk-on and then ended up on the team, oh my god, the, the, the newspapers can't get enough of that. You guys eat that up, you love it, it's a feel-good story, right? The movie Rudy, who's seen the movie Rudy? That's a successful walk-on story, right? So the movie's a, a uprising success story. How many plays did Rudy play in his college career? Two. And that's success. What about the other 99 guys who walked on and got cut or never played or whatever? So the coach's goal ultimately is to get you to walk on for nothing. If you show up and you're really good and you're the best player on the team, then I can always throw you some money in your next year. But I want to get you for the least amount that it takes because I want to save that money and give it to somebody else. Um, so what would be the average? It would be hard to say as a general. Um, typically in lacrosse, if you're getting a 50% scholarship, that's pretty darn good. Uh, probably, you know, anywhere from 15 to 40 is probably pretty, pretty typical. Uh, Want to add one other thing? Have you anyone ever heard the term when it comes to financial aid called stacking? You heard that term before? So let's say, um, let's say you qualify for a $8,000 presidential academic scholarship based on your SAT and your GPA, right? And the school costs, let's say it costs 30, and you're gonna get eight for um, academics, and the lacrosse coach is willing to chip in $8,000, which comes up to about, you know, a third or a fourth, so like a 25% scholarship, so they're gonna give you like $8,000 for athletics. Right? You take the eight, you take the eight, you stack it on top of one another, and you got 16, you know, it's 30, so you're paying 14. Right? Most schools won't stack. You take the eight, you take the eight, you take whichever one's better, and that's what you get. So if it's eight, nine, you get nine. If it's eight, seven, you get eight. They don't stack. So what does that mean? It really doesn't even matter if you're a lacrosse player or not. You and somebody else with the same SAT and GPA, you're both getting eight, regardless of if you play lacrosse. Because that money, whether it's athletic or academic, it's still coming from the school. So the lacrosse coach would, a lot of times, try to get a good student to come and not give them anything for lacrosse. There are schools that can stack. Um, every school has a little bit different financial aid situation, which is why you want to be in a lot of funnels and a lot of hats and, and, and try to get the best deal. Did I answer? Both of those, is that kind of what you're asking? Well, I mean, I know it gets across the map, and it depends on the conference, and the school, mm -hmm. and the division. Um, some D2 some schools, it depends on the school. Some of them have to give you at least a quarter. That's like the minimum for a lot of schools. It depends on the school. That's, again, that's, I just want to add, that's where academics are so important. Because even if you only get a quarter athletic scholarship, you may still be able to make up a lot of that, if not all that difference. An academic one. That's why we stress the academic. That's why it's so important. And it's been my experience that, yeah, the coach's job is to get you into school for as little as it's, it's going to cost him. If he can get you in there to his athletic team without using any athletic scholarship money, obviously he's got more for somebody else that maybe isn't as good as a student. But it's also my experience that if a coach wants you badly enough and you have multiple, if you're in multiple funnels, you have multiple offers, you have multiple schools offering you work one against the other, it's amazing how much money they can come up with at the end of the game, right at the very end, if they really want you badly enough. So you do tell them that you're getting something else somewhere else. Well, the, the, when, they, when they call you, I don't, I don't know, one of the first things they ask you when they call you is who else is recruiting you. And the second thing, because this is coming in your senior season, the second thing they ask you is how many offers and what other scholarship offers do you have? That's one of the first, those are probably the first two questions they ask you when they call you. So yeah, you do play them off the other, one off the other. Do, they, do these guys talk, do you all talk to the other coaches and say, Absolutely. 
And you always want to be honest. I got a fun story about that. It makes that fun. <laughs> so I had a kid from Louisiana that came up to visit um, the Mia Methodist, and you know his parents gave me the run around about we're really interested. You're our number one choice, and you know whatever. And uh, he left, and I got I walked them into the car. And I said, all right, guys, you know, have a safe trip. They're like, yeah, we're heading back to Louisiana. It's a long drive. You know, have a safe trip. You know, where, what highway are you going to take? And talk to them. Well, because, as I said earlier, I was sort of the de facto assistant coach for the women's lacrosse team. That afternoon, I actually drove the women's lacrosse team to play Guilford College up in Greensboro. <laughs> so I get to Guilford College, and one of my really good buddies is coach at Guilford College. So after I dropped the girls off at the stadium, at the stadium I went into his office. And you know, sat there with them, and you know, kind of shooting the bull because in college coaching in a sport like lacrosse, there are very, very few schools. They all go to the same conferences together. They all know each other. They talk to each other. They communicate very, very often. It's a very small network. Uh, I'm sitting in my friend Matt's office, and he goes, "Yeah, I got a recruit coming in like five minutes." And he's like, "Okay, well, I'll be out of here when he shows up." In walks the recruit that just left my school earlier that morning. He drove straight up, and the look on his face was priceless because it was like I just caught him cheating, right? And I was like, I, I don't care. I'm like, I, I understand that athletes are going to look at multiple schools, and he got sort of caught in a lie, which you never want to do. What you want to do is just, you want to be honest. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to be, you got to walk the line sort of between being proactive and being pushy. You don't want to come across too brash, but you do. They are going to talk to each other. They are going to know each other. You want to keep them up to date on who else is recruiting you. Um, like Bob was saying, that's really important. They're going to ask who's recruiting you. You want schools recruiting you. So, like, raise your hand here if you're interested in playing lacrosse in Alaska. <laughs> Nobody? Alaska? Nice. Even if you don't want to go to Alaska, Getting the University of Alaska, Anchorage, Division II school, I'm not sure if that, well, they have to have lacrosse. It was invented up there, right? So the, 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 the Inuit Indians have lacrosse. You know, that's, that's, where, that's where the whole game originated from. So uh, even if they recruit you and make you an offer, even if you have no interest in going there, it's valuable. Because then when the school that you really want calls you up and says, who's recruiting you, you say, oh, Alaska. And then like Bob was saying, they say, well, what does it mean? You have an offer? You say, yes, I have a legitimate scholarship offer. Who here has a Division I scholarship offer? Who here has a Division II offer? Okay. Don't, yeah, don't be offended because I say this to almost every kid that, that I meet with. You are not a scholarship level player until one thing happens. You know what that one thing is? You get the offer. Me and your dad could go out back here and talk about your potential. And you hear this all the time. You go to any of these events, you go, well, that guy's a D2 player. Well, that guy's D2 slash D3. Well, that guy's low D1, potential D2. You hear that all the time. That is all complete nonsense. It doesn't matter what anybody says about you. It doesn't matter what I say about you. It doesn't matter what Bob says about you. The only, it doesn't matter certainly what your parents say about you or your high school and club coaches. It really doesn't even matter what they say about you. The only people that really matter are the college coaches that are recruiting you. When they get, when a Division II school gives you an offer in writing to, to be on their team and a financial aid offer to come to their school, you are then legitimized as a Division II player or as a Division I player. Once you get that offer, now what happens is a snowball effect. Now you talk to one school and, no, what's, what's your name? Yeah. Nate. If I'm, if I'm coaching at Wingate College, and I, I call Nate, and I say, Nate, who's recruiting you? What would you say? Nobody. And maybe you got some letters, right? Some camp letters or something. So I say, do you have any offers? And you say, what do I think about you as a coach? What's my first impression? Not wanted, so maybe he's... Not that good. Not that good. Because there's really two ways I can figure out if I like him. I can do a thorough analysis of you. I can come to your practices. I can come to three or four of your games. I can talk to your coaches in detail. I can really get to know you as the, and your character and everything. That would take a lot of time. The easier way is just to see who's recruiting you. Oh, no one's recruiting you? Eh, must not be very good. I'm going to put you on my walk-on list. 
you can still get the emails, whatever, but I'm not going to dress up in the Monarch costume. I'm not going to, you know, come to 20-year games or whatever. Now, let's say you market yourself to the University of Alaska. They take an interest in you. It's really hard to get fast players up there because, you know, Alaska, not a lot of people. They take an interest in you. They make their Division II school. They make you a scholarship offer that includes, you know, four or five thousand dollars of lacrosse scholarship. When the la la lacrosse coach now calls you and says, "Hey, Nate, who's recruiting you?" What do you say? Alaska. Now, what does recruiting mean? Does it mean you got a letter inviting you to come to camp, or does it mean you got a scholarship offer in writing? You did in this case, right? So I'd say, do you get an offer from Alaska? Now, what does the coach think about you? Hmm. Must Here's a kid from you from Holly Springs. Here's a kid from Holly Springs. He's already got a Division II scholarship offer. Hey, assistant coach. Hey, graduate assistant. Go watch this guy next weekend. Go check this this Nate guy out because he's he he has another offer. Did your ability change at all? Your, your ability has nothing to do with it. It was the perception of your ability. So the perception is you're a legitimate scholarship player. Now, I coached for eight years. I had lots and lots of high school coaches call me up and tell me about their kids. I had lots and lots of dads call me up and tell me about their kids. I had speakerphone. Hey, I'm so-and-so, I want to tell you about my kid. Put it on speaker, I can check my emails while you tell me how great your kid is. That's fine, it's good, but calling them up and telling me about your kid is better than not calling. But what's really powerful is when I find out a kid has a scholarship offer from somebody else. Now I want to look at that kid. Does it mean I'm going to match Alaska on the spot? Eh, maybe not, but I'm at least going to put you in. I'm, I'm interested in you. But should he be saying to you what he got in the way of money? Yeah. Or legal not no, tell you because then, you know, you're, you can give me just a little bit more, you know, why don't, which, when you want to see what you're really going to offer? Uh, you can, I mean, now if they ask you, I would tell them. Uh, but. I don't think you have to play coy with them. I mean, I think it, it's in their best interest to know what they have to be. Um, the lacrosse coach might not have a ton of pull. They may or may not. You know, it's about if you got another school and you have a legitimate offer, but you have no interest in going to that school whatsoever, then you don't have a lot of power. You know, if it's another school you really have a lot of interest in going there, then you know you have the upper hand. You can say, hey, I'm going here unless you can beat this. But let's say, a lot, in this scenario, let's say Alaska gives you an offer for a bottom line price of $18,000. Um, you don't really have the upper hand. I mean, because you don't want to go to Alaska. You want this school to recruit you. So <laughs> it's probably in your best interest to say, hey, I got a great offer already. Um, I like it. I'm very grateful that they're recruiting me. But I'm really interested in your school because it's closer to home. It's better academic reputation. Um, you know, you want to be, and I think I know where you're coming from here. You want the coach to think that you really want to be there. Because I'm a person, right? So I have my own feelings, and, and it's not just a machine. When I'm recruiting kids like you guys, I want the best player, but you know what else? I also want to recruit kids I like. Because not only am I just recruiting these kids, I'm going to end up coaching them. So if you really want to be at my school, and you really want to play for me, I really want to recruit you a little bit. Now, it doesn't mean you could be awful and just really be really nice, and then I'm going to take you over somebody else who's really good. No, I mean, you have to have the ability. But assuming the ability is in the general ballpark, um, I'm going to want, I'm going to be drawn to and want to recruit kids that I actually really like. So by you kind of expressing how much you want to be a part of that school and how you really want to be there, you may think you're maybe overshowing your hand. It's actually a good thing because it helps them feel that you, you want them as well. Because when I'm sifting through 1103, uh, that's one of the main criteria is who wants to be here. I don't want somebody that thinks this is, you know, a, a, their, their safety school. I want somebody, this is their dream school. Um, so, yeah. What other questions? Those are great, great questions. Probably, so far. So uh, Bob mentioned some of this 
uh, earlier about the recruiting timelines. And you probably have heard some stuff about like NCAA rules about like when they can talk to you. Some of the dates that you might have been thrown out were, you know, you can receive email correspondence, you know, your junior year, September 1st. You can receive phone calls, you know, July 1st prior to your senior year. What I usually tell our clients and, and people in general about this is those dates don't matter to you. Those dates are for the college coaches to have to follow. You can communicate with college coaches anytime you want. You can pick up the phone tonight and call a college coach. Now, they may have to say, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to talk to you. If you're at an event, you can walk up to the college coach and say hi. They may have to say nothing more than an informal greeting, but you can't break any rules. It's a really kind of a catch-22 because there's rules preventing when the colleges can talk to kids, but you guys all know, right? There's kids that commit to colleges by sophomore, junior year. So how does that work? Well, coaches can't reach out to you until junior year, but this kid's a sophomore and he's already committed to Duke. How does this work? There's a behind the scenes recruiting process that is happening that you maybe don't see. So let's say a really good athlete's an eighth grader or a ninth grader. Uh, as a college coach, I could call his high school coach whenever I want. I could call his club coach. I could invite you to a camp and get you on campus and then legally talk to you when you're there. Um, the bottom line is, if I want you, I'm gonna find a way to recruit you. And there's all these rules preventing what I can do, but the point is, it's happening. Uh, if you think about like a scholarship offer, when, when you hear about a kid, let's say he's a junior, do you guys know any like juniors this year that are already committed? Do you have any guys on your team? Higher ed guys, yeah, something there. Okay, so coaches can't even legally send him a letter until 10 days ago. Uh, but he's already committed. You think about that. If a college coach has a scholarship, right, scholarship, athletic scholarship money, you're not giving that out on a whim. I mean, you're making sure this is the right fit because that's an investment. If you give a scholarship out and the kid ends up being a, a bad player, you might lose your job eventually if you give out too many scholarships to bad players. So you're going to make sure you find the right guy. You're not going to be introduced to a kid on Monday and give him a scholarship on Friday it's gonna be a long process of being introduced, like the, the school that, you're, two years. They got to know them, they tracked them, they followed them, they put them in a pool with other kids, they ranked them one, two, three, four, and then eventually they offered the first guy. If he said, I don't know what number, you know, maybe he was the first guy, but maybe they offered somebody else, and he said no, and then they went to number two, you know, whatever. Where is he going, by the way? UNC. Oh, great. As a sophomore. As a sophomore, yeah. yep, absolutely, and that's not rare. Well, we send out, like our last mailing was uh, September 1st, and we mailed out um, our volleyball and softball on September 1st, and we got a bunch of emails back from softballs. Uh, we sent our 2015 kids, which are juniors this year. Uh, we got emails back from lots of Division I programs that said, we're full for 2015, let me know who you got for 16. Tons of them, especially at the high levels, like, like UNC. Yeah. <laughs> if, um, now, that stuff's all happening behind the scenes. So in the process, sometimes it's two years or at least six months or at least a year. So it starts way back there. So what do you need to do as sort of a um, call to action now is start developing the relationships so that eventually it's gonna end up in the marriage at the end, right, of the scholarship. It's not like you're gonna be at an event next summer, someone's gonna see you and then you're getting an offer right then. They have to get to know you now so think about it this way. Next summer, next July is a big recruiting year for you guys, right? Other than you seniors. Uh, if you want college coaches to come watch you next July, you need to cultivate those relationships now. First of all, you need to start. So they gotta know who you are. So you gotta get them your information or be introduced to them or get your coach to call them or get us to, to be the mediator or somebody to start the relationship. And then you gotta cultivate it. And you got to keep in touch, and then hopefully next summer they're going to do that evaluation and eventual offer or commitment that they'll give to you. So to answer your question, it, it's never too late. If you're an eighth grader and you're not really sure you want to play in college and you might get into cars and girls or whatever, well, should you start? No, you should probably wait and make sure you're serious about it. But if you're in ninth or tenth grade and you're serious about wanting to play and you know that 
lacrosse or tennis or whatever it might be is going to be an important part of your college decision, it's in your best interest athletically and financially to get started as soon as you possibly can. There are still opportunities out there, plenty of opportunities for seniors. It's not too late. You know, your top the level, top line schools, you know, a lot of them do start recruiting kids when they're freshmen, sophomores, so that they do commit to those schools when you're a junior. But there are plenty of other opportunities out there for seniors. Just not as many. Just be realistic about it. Not as many as if you if you had started when you were freshman or sophomore. One thing I think is really cool about our, our 2012 class, you know, 2012, 2013 class, are in college now, right? And a lot of kids, I just talked to a kid um, just yesterday that's at Southern Virginia. Uh, a lot of kids that we have that have been through our program are at schools now that when we first met them, they had never heard of that school. Because if I ask you to really get out a piece of paper right now and write down the names of the colleges that have lacrosse teams, how many do you think you could name? 20, 50, if somebody was pretty detailed, they might be able to maybe name 100. Um, but there's, you know, upwards close to 400 now. Um, and the point is, is that as Bob was saying, there's a place for you. It may not be UNC. It may not be due, but there is a place that has awesome education, a good price, and great opportunity to play lacrosse. It's a matter of you finding that place. I think it's cool when we get a kid through our program and they end up at their dream school that they already knew about. Of course, I'm happy that we were able to be a service and make that happen, but you know what I think is even cooler? When we take a kid in our program and he ends up at a school that when I sat down in their living room, they didn't even know what that school was. And now they're gonna go there, they're gonna be an alumni from there, it's not just a four-year decision. It turns out being really a lifetime decision. It's a 40-year decision. Where you play college will be with you for the rest of your life. You're going to take a picture like that when you're old like me and show it to people and say, you know, this is where I was or whatever. Um, it's, it's so important that you get it right. What I can tell you from my experience, um, both as a college coach and then with Student Athlete World, is I saw a lot of kids that went through the process and then you know, didn't play or went to the wrong school, and they spend the rest of their life regretting the fact that they didn't play. And a lot of these kids make excuses about it and say, well, you know, I got hurt, or, you know, the coach dogged me, or every excuse under the sun. But the reality is, they just didn't find the right school that was right for them. They went to a school that they were never going to play at. They went to a Division One school to walk on, and I know they're not going to play you know, anybody that knows, they're not going to play there. But then they regret it. They're sitting in their dorm room. You wouldn't believe how many phone calls we get from juniors and seniors at NC State or juniors and seniors sitting in a dorm room somewhere saying, I want to play, you know, college lacrosse somewhere. And I'm like, there aren't many colleges out there looking for a, a transfer with one year of eligibility that's been playing intramural softball for three years. You know, that it's, it's over for you. You got one chance to do something. You're gonna grow up, you're gonna do awesome stuff with your life, whether you're a doctor or lawyer or in business or whatever. You got one chance to play college lacrosse. So it's important that you do it right. Yeah, I'm, I'm 52 years old, and my college years were four of the best years of my life. You know, they really were. And like you said, you have one chance to get it right. And, and what you wanna do is find the right academic fit, just the right school for you get the best education you can, and if you have the opportunity to play lacrosse in college, that's a great thing. If you have the ability to help lacrosse pay for college, that's a great thing for the parents, too. It's just a great opportunity. Cool. What about those of you that haven't asked a question? I know there's one in your mind that you've been waiting to ask all day. You're going to go home and not ask it. Be disappointed. Cool. Well, let me take. You sure, we don't have any. Let me take 60 seconds and just tell you about potentially some next steps with Student Athlete World. If you're interested, if you're not interested in us, totally cool. I hope that you had a uh, you learned a couple things tonight um, and you had a good time and it was worth it for you. If you are interested in talking about what we do, I don't want to spend tonight talking about that, uh, but. Bob or myself can actually set up a home visit with you where we come and we, we sit down and spend a couple good hours with you talking about um, getting to know you to make sure that you're somebody that we can help because believe it or not, uh, we are not for every kid. 
Uh, we are looking for specific criteria uh, because we have to be able to help you. I live in Holly Springs. The last thing I want is somebody to use our program, us not be able to help them, and then you tell other people that Student Happy World is a crappy company. That kills me. Uh, we, the only thing that I have in this business, the most important thing to me is my reputation, and the word of mouth is so important. I don't have millions of dollars to do advertising on a national level. This is a, we have about 38 people in our company, and we all live doing this on word of mouth. So because of that, I want to make sure that you're the right fit. If you come in and you say, well, I only want to play at Duke and UNC. I'm a senior. I've never got a letter from a college coach before, and we want to give you a little bit of money, and we want you to help us go to UNC. And then if I were to say, absolutely, I'll make all your dreams come true. And then I take that check and I cash it, and then a year from now, you know, you're not playing at UNC. You're going to tell people that, you know, this guy's a liar. So I don't want to do that. I want to make sure that, that you're realistic, that we can help you. I want you guys to sit down and get to know Bob or get to know myself and make sure that, you're some, uh, that we're somebody that you want to work with. So that visit's a no-pressure um, kind of visit where you, we can sit down and talk a little bit more detail about some of the things we talked about today a little more specific to you personally, your major, the types of schools you're looking at, the geography around the country, and the types of different options that might be available for you. And then of course we'll talk about how our program actually works, what we do. Uh, the way that I kind of explain what we do is we are, we are basically match.com for you in college recruiting. We're trying to get you hooked up with the right schools and the right programs, introduce them, uh, we work really hard to get college coaches to realize that we're honest and realistic with them, and we work really hard to get our clients to get on the same page with us. Uh, the other thing we're really doing is helping navigate, and helping empower you, and helping you navigate through the program. What do I need to do? When do I need to do it? How do I do it? This program is a joint effort. It's not a thing where you hire us, and you go about your life, and, you, and six months later you say, all right, Bob, where am I going to college? It's not that. It's a joint commitment between the athlete, the parent, and us to work together. Uh, there's a lot of companies out there doing college recruiting. There's some big national ones like NCSA. If you want somebody just to tell you what you want to hear, call them up. They'll tell you whatever you want, whatever you want to hear. Uh, there's small companies. What I really think is cool about Student Athlete World is that we're big enough to have some really fancy tools. We've helped about 600 kids. Uh, so we have these, these, uh, this national reputation, but yet we're small enough to still know each of our clients by name. And what's even cooler is that the home office here is in Holly Springs, North Carolina. Uh, so that meeting can be, you know, you can set it up tonight, we can find a time to come and sit down, we can tell you about what we do and get a plan to, uh, to get started. Before you leave, I wanna mention two things. I have up here um, a prospectus. This tells a little bit more detail about what we do, six or seven pages. Some of our success stories, more detail about actually student. Take one of these, these are of course free. This book I have, nobody take it, but this is a 50 page book that has uh, financial aid examples of our clients. Uh, really cool, good stuff in here. About 200 testimonials from parents are in here. So please, I'm gonna set this right here. Uh, please feel free to, to page through that. I have some flyers um, somewhere. Bob and I both have business cards. And then like I said, this book is $30 online. It's 20 tonight. We do accept credit card. I have the iPad here that I can run it. Uh, this would be a great first step for anybody serious about playing in college. The whole point of this book is a do, like I said, it's a do-it-yourself guide. It'll help you get a plan started, talk some more detail about some of those things I talked about today. Uh, whew, that's it. That's all I got. Thank you so much for your time and being here today.